Thank you so much, Natalie. Joining us now, we have a full panel of guests and a very exciting topic to talk about, which is the art of storytelling and the tools we use to tell stories for very complex science. So, Mark, I'd actually like to, to start with you. I mean, you are involved with trying to make Asteroid Day known about globally, and you've also tried to encourage people to understand physics and the consequences of asteroid Airbus. So tell us a little bit about what it takes to create visualizations. Well, so I've been doing uh, a lot of computer simulations of asteroid impacts, and one of the things I use those for is to assess the risk, to try to understand the amount of damage on the ground and how people are at risk and understanding the mechanisms. And when I first started doing this, back in the stone age of computing, all we could do really was output numbers, and then we started graphing the numbers and making very technical graphs and trying to understand what was going on. But when we started being able to create images, we really enhanced our own understanding. And, and now we, we not only get 2D, two-dimensional snapshots, we can create beautiful three-dimensional images and even three-dimensional movies, so animations. And once I started being able to see the animations, uh, I could see phenomena that I really couldn't have extracted from the numbers because people have a visual cortex. A lot of processing and understanding goes on before you're conscious of it. It goes directly from your eyes into the part of the uh, brain that, that processes information. And then the thinking part of your brain um, gets a much deeper understanding of, of, of what is going on. And now we can start showing these to people and showing them to the public, and it works for the public as well. People can look at something and say, I really understand what's going on. So it has a dual function, really. It has the function of allowing great scientists to understand their work and to literally see their work in a completely different way. And also, it allows people without a scientific background to become more engaged in it. That's right. So, so it's, it's, it's really coming from two angles. Now, Mario, you lead the data intensive research in astrophysics and cosmology, the Institute of uh, University of Washington. So Tell us about the LSST and other telescopes coming online with new visualization data. Yeah. So, so LSST is a telescope that's about to reach first light next year. Um, it is going to be by far the largest optical survey in existence when it starts. It's an 8-meter telescope. What's unique about it is it's going to survey the entire visible sky roughly every three nights, and it will do that for, the, for 10 years. So what we're, the way we think about it is we're downloading this huge data set of our sky and putting it online, putting it in a database. So the trouble we have with that is it's actually reasonably straightforward to do that. And then you ask yourself, well, how am I actually going to extract any knowledge or any understanding out of such data set? For every star in the sky, for every asteroid, we're going to have hundreds, if not thousands, different things we measure. So you can think of this as trying to find correlations, trying to understand what's happening in a thousand-dimensional space. There may be some special shape in a thousand-dimensional space, how all these dots are aligned. And how do you do that? So with LSST, that is a challenge. There are techniques that are being developed today that, that um, do things called dimension, dimensionality reduction to, to take these thousand-dimensional spaces and uh, flatten them down to maybe two or three that we can actually visualize. And then mechanically how it happens is it all happens through the web browser. In the end, we all end up staring at something that looks like a two-dimensional plot or a three-dimensional plot that we interact with either on our cell phone or, or, or on, just a, on just a computer. But it's really a technology that's just starting up. And I think if you ask me this question in two or three years, um, I might give you a somewhat different answer just how quickly this all, all this is moving. It's not just that, but I, I, you, you also work on the LSST, I believe, Lynn. It's, you're talking about a 10-year period of mapping an enormous amount of information. Anybody with a, a phone in their pocket, which is pretty much everybody here and most people watching, the rate of change of technology. So how, Lynn, do you think about that when you're thinking about this very long-term project and you're thinking about the rate of technology change whilst you're trying to measure the information? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a really great question. Um, 
I know that since I joined the project uh, just a little bit over 10 years ago, which is quite a while in, in, in terms of how the technology is developed in this, this area, we've gone from thinking that we would present um, results and, and it let people investigate our databases with, with some particular sort of platform, um, some particular tools, and then we've, we've done some work on those and then realized maybe we need something else that can process larger amounts of data, make it easier for people to investigate correlations between different properties. Um, I myself am working a lot on what the survey strategy will be, so exactly how we will decide where to point the telescope. Um, and so for this work, one of the, the problems is that we're trying to satisfy a lot of different requirements from different scientists. And so, so we're, sa we're saying, how is this strategy suitable for your science goal? And to do that, we actually built a framework so that people could build in their requirements and then look at plots of the output. But even then we find that like a plot is really helpful. Um, so, you know, it's just basically an image of, of what kind of information they're going to be able to get. But sometimes a movie is necessary too. So there's always more information that you want to be able to fold in and include. Um, I know there's some people at the University of Washington who are working on 3D interactive data visualization techniques and it's, it's really cool and I'm very excited to see where it's going to go next. And thinking about that, Ryan, I believe that you have an award-winning visualization studio and produced a show called Incoming. So you can tell us all about that. And it tells the story of asteroids and their role in our solar system. So tell us how you use real data to create these immersive shows. So I work at the California Academy of Sciences, which is a, an institution with a 166-year-long year history of studying the natural world. And as a natural history museum, we rely on authentic data and authentic experiences to tell our stories. So when we tell an astronomy story, we do the same thing. We work with data from spacecraft, with calculations from, for example, Mark Bausler, who provided uh, a, a framework for the, uh, the, the, it, the Chelyabinsk impact uh, that appears in the incoming planetarium show. Uh, so those become the foundation of the story, and then we look at how those can be wrapped into a narrative that will pull people into a, into a really dramatic tale that involves the origin and, and history of life on our planet, uh, the possibility that, well, in fact, the extinction of the well-known dinosaurs, some of which you walk by on your way into the California Academy of Sciences, uh, and the future of life on our planet. So these are really compelling narratives. And when you knit that together with a, uh, a set of visuals that are immersive, that really surround you in the planetarium, uh, you come up with, as it turns out, an award-winning planetarium show, as you said, it's called Incoming. Uh, it started out in the California Academy of Sciences back in 2016, and it's played in dozens of theaters around the world since. Uh, and we've been also delighted to take portions of that show, unfortunately not immersive, but uh, for HD screens, uh, and share those with schools around the world. And so, in fact, we have uh, an online education program that includes components of Incoming uh, for schools uh, and, and, and students in literally every country on, on the planet. So uh, that's also a great venue to take those immersive visuals and translate them into something that's accessible by a very broad audience. So really bringing it to the public. And Patrick, I know that you've worked with Brian May, co-founder of Asteroid Day as well, to help create really strong visualizations to help learn about asteroids. And of course, we spoke earlier about two extremely exciting missions you're involved with, Osiris Rex and Hayabusa too. So tell us about your involvement and your work with Brian May. Okay, yeah, first I, I, I as a, a Mark, I come from the simulation world and I agree with him that, you know, with simulations before we just have data, graphics, and now we can do marvelous movies. So he's trying to understand the impact on Earth. I try to understand how asteroids form by collision to form these kind of shapes, effectively. And this is good because with movies you understand better, you see whether the simulation is wrong. Uh, when it looks realistic, doesn't mean it's right. You always need a validation point, and that's why space missions are fundamental, because we can get direct images, direct movies of a cratering, like for An Hayabusa 2. And, uh, and having the possibility to also watch this in 3D from 300 million kilometers away is 
an ad which is not just for fun, it's really scientifically fundamental because it can measure better the shape of the boulder, the height, all the things that you do, you need both for engineering and science purpose. And Brian used this kind of, uh, of glasses with an iPhone and uh, if you send him uh, two images separated by an angle, he can transform that with his art uh, and his collaborator, by the way, Claudia Manzoni also, uh, these two images in a 3D image. And <laughs> he's laughing when I say that each time I watch one of the images he sent me, I just do that and I need to be attached on a chair because it's so fantastic that I fall each time. And he's really excited and so he's not only a, a musician, an astrophysicist, but he has this ability uh, to do this with his collaborator, Claudia, in a way, I mean, really, it's each time it's like a first time, it's totally crazy. And really, really, it's fantastic. <laughs> well, I did have a little look through that just before we came on stage, and it really is fantastic. You see it in such a close way. And for us mere mortals who will never get up into space, we can feel that we're closer to something so very special, but such a long way away. <laughs> Can, can I just add that we have one big luck compared to our previous uh, colleagues, the researchers from before the space exploration, is that now we have images to show. And, you know, I mean, we have an easy job now because you just show an image of Ryugu or Bennu or you take even Jupiter. There is a fantastic mission, Juno, around Jupiter, showing images like, you know, I mean, contemporary art. You put uh, the name of an artist from contemporary art on one of these images and you sell it uh, at a very high price because they are artistic. And so this is very important because this is a way to make people dream. We have actual images of other worlds to show and that's very, uh, very good. Scott, turning to you, firstly, nice to have you on stage. You've been doing a very active job next door all afternoon. Thank you for your very hard work. You managed to find a chair for once. So you're an astrophysicist and also highly involved in the gaming world. So for those of us who may not be as highly involved, apart from our children, in the gaming world, tell us what's exciting for you from your vantage point as a scientist as well. What's educational and fun? Well, I think that uh, there's many new applications out there that let people just mess around in space. I mean, literally, there's a fantastic virtual reality uh, sim called Universe Sandbox, and you're supposed to be able to put planets in orbit around each other and watch gravity do its thing, but in VR, you can actually pick up the object with your hand and then throw it at the Earth and make craters. There's a magnificent you know, simulation which shows all the near-Earth asteroids, and you can sit on the Earth and watch them fly around you. For the very first asteroid day, actually, I made a, what's called a 360 video, a spherical video, so you can move your viewpoint, and it put you on the planet Earth, and initially you can see the stars, but then I flip a switch and you can turn on and see all the asteroids. And that's become you know, one of my more popular videos, for sure. Um, I mean, I make videos and I really tell stories all the time, but it's fantastic when you can take data and transform it in a way that tells a story. And I think I have this one about the discovery of asteroids over the last 30, 40, 50 years, and it just shows little flashes when they were discovered. And that was interesting initially, but then people saw the patterns. They said, why is it pulsing? Well, it's pulsing because the moon, when it's full, we discover less asteroids. And when it's new, we discover more. So there's this pulse, there's these rays. And it, it turned out that I'd set it to music, and I just happened to pick music with the tempo of the full moon, of the lunar cycle. That was very lucky. It was, I think it was my <laughs> DJ ear that picked that out. <laughs> and do you find from the people who are coming to your channel, your YouTube channel, to watch these videos that you produce, are they mostly scientists, do you happen to know, or are they...? They're mostly people interested in casually learning anything, and they always want more detail. And it's amazing the level of detail you can go to with a, an audience that is engaged. And the trick is just getting them engaged in the question in the first place. Well, that's exactly why we're here today yeah. for Asteroid Day. And coming back to you, Mark, could you tell us a little about the book you have right next to you? The, the, the book? The book. Yeah. So I just um, purchased this book. Um, it's by my friend David Eicher, who's the editor of Astronomy Magazine, and a guy named Brian May, um, <laughs> who is a co-founder of Asteroid Day, among other things. And it's full of 3D images 
from moon from the moon including astronauts walking on the moon and it's it's a good illustration of what i was talking about you can look at a contour map of the moon or you can look at the 3d image of the moon and when you see a 3d image of craters on the moon and the terrain of the moon you really understand you you understand the topography in a way that you you can't understand just by looking at a contour map. So it's wonderful. And Brian May gave a presentation on this the other day with, with David Iker, and Buzz Aldrin was in the front row uh, looking through 3D glasses at an image of him standing on the moon, and I could uh, see him kind of thinking, it's almost like you're there. <laughs> Probably brought back an awful lot of memories to him. Now, for you, Ed, it, you've worked in this field for a very long time. You've probably seen enormous changes, as we all have in our lifetimes, the rate of technological change, how that changes, how one learns. So tell us about your day when you were training to become an astronaut and how these story visualizations can even change education. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I want to sort of tag on a little bit to, you know, what a couple of folks said here that it, we're dealing with an inherently four-dimensional data set, and that means it's, it's spatial, it's, got, it's not flat, there's three dimensions, but time, too, so that things are moving. But what's become possible recently is to be able to interact with it, not just a movie, but to be able to you know, run it forward and backwards or to move objects and that sort of thing. And I think that's going to be really important. So when I think about the kind of mapping that we're doing of the solar system, and I think about, well, how can we really interact with that so you can explore it? I think you're going to want, eventually, to have this be some sort of virtual reality or augmented reality uh, kind of thing. So imagine yourself coming into this big room. It's a beautiful room here in Luxembourg. But imagine in the middle a floating solar system with all the asteroids moving around where you could point to one and say, you know, tell me about that one. Or what, you know, plot a trajectory between this and that. Or, you know, hey, that one, you know, I noticed that it's coming close to the Earth. You know, I'll move time forward and say, well, on this date. That really is sort of the vision of what eventually we want to get to with the data set that's going to be coming in um, from all these missions and telescopes. Because that, when you have a, a, a system like that, and you have something that people can use, people can build off of, um, you know, the diff a, a modern map is no longer a static object, it is a service. One in which you can, you can ask the map to tell you things. Uh, like an online map, you can tell it, you can ask it to give me directions to a certain place or things like that. And I want to be able to say, well, how do I plot a trajectory to here? It's, just, it's, it's kind of like finding your nearest Starbucks, you know, except it's on another asteroid somewhere else. But, um, you know, there, there is a time element to it. And sort of in my mind, I picture this being able to see this. So imagine being able to have a pair of glasses or something like that, that where you walked in, there, you know, floating in front of the room is the solar system. And that's, that's what I'd like to get to. And I think we can get there in a couple of years. It's a beautiful image. I can see it already in Mudam or one other beautiful museum where there is the space. To, even in the home one day, perhaps, we'll have that. But I wonder who would like to pick up on the idea that the people who are making these visualizations are using the data set to create an image possibly a moving image in some form, they have a great responsibility also because one can't unsee, in a way, what one has seen. And so it changes one's mind as to how they see. It's like changing a book into a film, for example. So perhaps, I don't know, Ryan, would you like to pick up on the idea of how do you hold the responsibility as an artist using the data set to provide images? It's something we talk about a lot when we're in the process of creating shows. And I think that uh, what we come back to is what we want people to learn from the visualization that we're created. So because our, our goal is typically education, not exploration of data so much, but, but educating people on the topic. Uh, we start with, we use that as a starting point in understanding the data, then choose how we want to illustrate it. So we wanted people to understand there are many, many very small asteroids and only a few very large asteroids. So uh, we created visualizations that, that highlighted uh, the frequency of those different 
objects based on, on the data we had available at the time, which has dramatically increased in the intervening few years. Um, so we simply try to uh, try to understand what we want people to, to use as a takeaway uh, and then be selective about how we represent it. Because one of the other challenges is if you simply present raw data and uh, kind of unfiltered data, uh, that can be very overwhelming, particularly if you're talking about a planetarium where images are flashing by at 30 frames a second, you've got someone narrating at you and you've got a music, a soundtrack. It's hard to kind of keep track of what's going on. So we do have to sort of curate and there is certainly a, a very distinct responsibility to that. Thank you all so much for your thoughts. I can't wait for the next few years where we see more of these 3D images, whether floating in rooms like this or within books with our 3D glasses. And now, Solomon, it's back to you. Thank you. Joining me now is Bruno Marin from the European Space Agency all the way in Madrid. Hi, Bruno. Hi. How are you? Very good, and yourself? I'm fine. So, now, this sounds like a, a plot from a movie. However, should there be that scenario where the world is being alerted to a possible impact from asteroids, what can people do to prevent this? Okay, so whenever that happens, uh, it's really going to be in the hands of uh, international bodies yeah. cooperating to deflect the asteroid. Of course. But something people can do before that happens is to help uh, scientists uh, identify potential hazardous asteroids. And uh, this they can do, for example, by looking at archival images, for example, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay. And identifying the asteroid trails on the images, uh, such that they can be then their orbits can be reconstructed, and we can figure out whether they are going to hit the Earth or not. And in particular, we have just released a citizen science project to allow people to look into HST images where we think an asteroid should be flying by, yeah. and identify it. And with the markings from people, we will figure out their orbits a lot better. And for the bright ones that we can very easily detect, which are the closest ones and the potentially most dangerous ones, uh, just one person uh, finding an asteroid and marking the positions in the image could help uh, refining the orbit and figuring out whether this object is in the course of Earth, a collision to Earth or not. Oh, that's, that's fascinating stuff. And Bruno, uh, I'm so glad that should that scenario happen, we know we have you on our side, okay? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Over to you, Christine. Thank you. We're here one last time today with Eric Boutini, and we just moved on over from the meteorite collection over to the moon rock exhibits. Eric, how did the moon end up in Luxembourg? Well, these are fragments, fragments of the moon that have been returned uh, from the Apollo astronauts. We have got here fragments from two different missions, from the Apollo 11, the first mission, and from Apollo 17, which was the last mission. Do you know how much moon they actually brought back? Well, they brought back about uh, 400 kilograms, and uh, these have been distributed to several countries all over the world by the Americans, and uh, well, we got only here uh, some grams, some micrograms, but it's interesting. For our viewers, this is actually tiny, so it's definitely worth seeing, it's impressive, but you're gonna have to come up real close. And now is actually a really good time to visit, right, Eric? Well, that's right, because we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, and so uh, it's really an opportunity to come to the museum and have a look at these moonwalks. Thanks, Eric. That's it from us today. We're going over to the Luxembourg Science Center. Thank you, Christine. We are on Earth, we are also standing next to Earth, and I believe that, Guillaume, you are holding the moon. Absolutely, Cordula. Um, this is a one meter in diameter ball, representing the Earth, and at this scale, the moon would be as large as this basketball. So, as you know, people often say the moon is our best natural shield for asteroid, and this is something I would like to test with a small visualization. Um, so, if that's the moon at this scale, the question is how far from the Earth should we put this ball? And most people will tend to answer something like this, you know, this okay. distance. That's, that's pretty close. 
That's pretty close indeed. As a matter of fact, the moon is much further out, and this is something Justine will help us visualize. Justine, ready to catch the ball? Okay, keep going, Justine. You're almost halfway to, to the exact position of the moon. The moon is 400,000 kilometers away from the Earth. And Justine is about to reach that point. Yeah, stop. There you are, Justine. Look how far the moon is from the Earth uh, in, in reality. <laughs> but looking at it like this, it doesn't look like the moon can actually protect Earth from asteroids. Well, imagine you'd have asteroids running towards the Earth from all directions. Uh, the moon we know, would only catch those that are crossing its section. And at this scale, it would be one, the, the chances would be one over 200,000, which is not much. And that's why we still need to watch the sky to, um, well, look for new dangerous celestial bodies. And that is what Asteroid Day is all about. And with that, we go to a message from our regional coordinators. Join us for Asteroid Day on June the 30th. Participe la Ziua Asteroidului. Comment s'en prête à ce jour sur Asteroid Day? It's the first day of the Ziua Asteroid Day on the 30th of June. The 30th of June, participe à l'Asteroid Day. Unidos a nosotros en el próximo Asteroid Day de 2017. Come to Asteroid Day on the 30th of June. Kom og vær med. Til at støde den dag den 30. juli. Og nu er det sådan, at vi har stået i dag. Jo, kig til den juli. Participe du Asteroid Day, dia du Asteroid Day, 30. de juli. Kom til Asteroid Day, am 30. 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 juli. Akkompagnernos, el 30. de junio, para Asteroid Day. Mach mit beim Asteroidentag am 30. Juni. Unete al día del asteroide el 30 de junio. Tanja Chao Xin Xin Ri, Jiu Zai Liu Yue San Si Ri. De Junpa de Shamaneta, de Asteroid Narewal Brasbande, Monsera Yau Zai Shai. El 30 de junio, unete al día del asteroide. Unanse al día del asteroide, este 30 de junio, en Guatemala. Montaki Sobo Shiu. Ακολουθήστε μας την Παγκόσμια ημέρα αστεροειδών στις 30 Ιούνι από την Ελλάδα. Come zum Asteroiden Tag am 30 Ιούνι. Ούνανσε al día del asteroide el 30 de junio. Ελάτε να γιορτάσουμε μαζί την Παγκόσμια ημέρα αστεροειδών στην Κύπρο στις 30 Ιούνι. Ένα γέτο που αγαπάει το πλανητήριο με το πλανητήριο με το πλανητήριο με το Join us at Ghana Planetarium on the 30th of June for Asteroid Day. In any moment, I am Asteroid on the 30th of June at Ghana Planetarium. Pridruje te se manifestati i dan Asteroida 30th of June. Namaskar, Mr. Sulbatari, Kathmandu Nepal. This is the 2017th of June, Nepal World Day is made. In this case, we will be able to make the Asteroid Day of Nepal. Hi fellow Kiwis, join us for Asteroid Day on Friday the 30th of June 2017. <laughs> Desde Venezuela los invito a celebrar el Día del Asteroide el 30 de junio. Welcome again, Greg from Catalina Sky Survey, and uh, I would like to ask you uh, to comment with us your last year. I know it has been very special. You have found a lot of asteroids, and you are really doing great. I would like to have your comments on this. And uh, I will be very happy to learn from you. What, the, what are your thoughts after this superb year at Catalina? That's right. Uh, 2018, we discovered 1,056 new near-Earth asteroids. And this is uh, a record. No other survey has posted uh, over 1,000 uh, near-Earth asteroids. So. We were really delighted uh, to have such a fantastic year 
in addition to the quantity, uh, the quality was, was fantastic too. 20% uh, of those were 140 meters or larger uh, objects. And these are the uh, size that are mandated by the U.S. Congress that we focus our attention uh, to discover. I would also like to mention that we discovered four uh, one kilometer or larger objects. And these are becoming less common to discover because the models show that there are likely about 950 to 1,000 of these. We currently have 895 discovered, so uh, there's not many left to discover. So the, the fact that we did four is really uh, quite a feat. Uh, one of those objects happened to be the largest uh, potentially hazardous object uh, discovered last year. It was 2018 XV5 discovered by my Catalina colleague, Alex Gibbs. And this is uh, over one kilometer large wow. and uh, also a potentially hazardous asteroid, meaning that the PHA is have to cross a size threshold, which one kilometer certainly does, and also a uh, proximity to Earth's neighborhood in its orbit. And this one, in its many orbits uh, uh, around the sun at some point, does come in Earth's neighborhood about 12 Earth lunar distances. So a large object and one that could potentially come quite close to the Earth. But I must emphasize, it poses no danger. There are no impact uh, threats from this particular asteroid. But it, what, it is one that needs to be very carefully and closely tracked in the many years to come. So it's, it has been a great year, but I'm sure you will have even a better year, the new one. And it has been a pleasure, Greg, to have you here. And I wish you a very pleasant night with a lot of asteroids and all the very best to you and all the people at Catalina Sky Survey. Thank you, Luca. Thanks for letting us be part of Asteroid Day 2019. And now it is time for us to see an Asteroid Day video. As Apollo 9 astronaut Rusty Schweikart likes to remind us, we are the crew of Spaceship Earth, and it's our obligation to protect our planet. And what better way than outstanding programming like Asteroid Day Live, which teaches us about the origins of our solar system and key actors in its creation, like asteroids. Asteroid Day Live is the only programming dedicated to introducing you to many of the most prominent asteroid experts in the world. We learn by listening to them share their personal experiences and knowledge of how our solar system was formed, how it is evolving, and how we can protect our beautiful blue planet. But this programming wouldn't be possible without the generous support of major sponsors, including the government of Luxembourg and you. You play a critical role in our ability to shine a bright spotlight on the leading work of astronomers, engineers, scientists, space mission operators, and astronauts, our global rock stars, who bring the topic of asteroids closer to people of all ages and remind our government leaders of the importance of funding planetary science. Asteroids play an important role in our lives from the formation of our solar system to their extraordinary value for future resource utilization to enabling ongoing exploration of our solar system and finally, when they impact our home planet. Asteroid Day is more than just a broadcast program. It's thousands of independently organized events in 192 countries. These events are the heart and soul of Asteroid Day as they connect and engage students on the subject of asteroids. For many students across the world, Asteroid Day is their only opportunity to listen to, learn from, and to meet astronomers, astrophysicists, and astronauts, heroes of the STEM generation. Your support enables the growth of our network of independent event organizers, so more events can take place. It allows us to not only encourage the future generation of scientists, but to grow our online library of educational tools, enabling more people to dig deeper into asteroids and to connect to scientists, observers, and astronauts. 
Your support enables us to meet the goals of the United Nations Office for the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space Affairs by generating awareness of what we can do to protect our planet. Please consider becoming part of this movement by donating to Asteroid Day today.